Welcome to Government. This is Will Sanchez. My special guest tonight is Stacy Creamer. She runs for the Central Park Track Club, and she works out with something called Full Throttle. I first heard about Stacy from Dr. Dan Hamder. He was reminiscing about his book. He was a sub three marathoner. He called Stacy and she suggested to go out for a run. That sealed the deal. Ever since, I've learned that Stacy always goes the extra mile in everything she does. I'm delighted to have Stacy as a guest. Thank you. Stacy, before we go into full throttle, mm -hmm. very interesting name, <laughs> let's introduce you to our audience. Sure, I'm happy to. Um, I was born in Philadelphia, and uh, I'm the eldest of five children. My poor mom had five kids in 10 years. <laughs> and I have three brothers and one sister. Uh, my sister's a runner. I guess really just the girls are runners. Uh, my brother runs a little bit. Shane, my second oldest, uh, below me. And we lived in Harrisburg briefly for about a two-year period, then moved back to Philadelphia to the Chestnut Hill area. I guess with all those siblings, you had to be very active to protect yourself. <laughs> Maybe a lot of wrestling and <laughs> a bit of fighting, I'm sorry to report. But uh, I really didn't do any sports until I got to college. I went to Yale. Wow, so you must have been a very good student. I don't know. Or I fooled them. I don't know. Oh, you I fooled them. I don't think so. <laughs> in those days, you had to pass rigorous exams. It's pretty tough to get in still, I think. Does that mean you were a studious uh, person as a high school? Uh, very studious, and also very studious my whole first year of, of Yale. And what happened was I had roommates who were in a program at Yale called Directed Studies, which was a very intense, even uber Yale. And I guess I sort of mimicked them. I wasn't in the program, but I wound up working all the time, studying the way they were. And after my freshman year, I thought, well, I don't want to keep doing that for four years. So I really wanted to expand my horizon. So I did two things, actually. I tried out for an a cappella singing group. They're quite popular at Yale. Uh -huh. And I don't sing very well. <laughs> so that was kind of a miracle that I got in, but I can hit low notes. So another friend of mine likes to say he and I are the two uh, least musically talented people ever to make a Yale singing group and maybe the least athletically talented person too, maybe not, but I wanted to try a sport as well. And I looked in the blue book, which had all the information about our school and uh, saw fencing on the list. And I thought, I bet people haven't fenced before college. And at that time it was true. Now there are very robust programs at high schools. I talked to someone today, uh, Eddie Stern, who you should also interview probably someday. But anyway, but I was right then. So very fortunately, I went out for the team and made it and ultimately made varsity. And my coach, Henry Hiratunian, is still the coach at Yale today. Wow. He's and you love fencing, obviously. I loved it. I can't say I was the most talented fencer, but it's good enough for the team. And it was a full year sport. Sometimes I think my poor parents sent me to college so I could fence and sing in my singing group, The New Blue. <laughs> but did you have a major in college? I did. I was an English major. English major. Because I know you you publish in the publishing business. Yes, I'm, a, oh, I'm an editor. Do you still fence today? I don't. I always say if I'd win the lottery, I would go back to fencing. And I have a friend, uh, I work out at Chelsea Piers with the triathlon team that we'll get to, and uh, she is uh, an age group fencer. The same kind of thing is very interesting has happened in fencing, which happened in running, which is, uh, you know, it used to be when runners would get past like 23 or, you know, they'd stop running. There wasn't this robust uh, age group running system, mm. and the same for fencing. The people I was fencing with after college were all headed for the Olympics and were making it, and I wasn't really that caliber. Um, so that's part of the reason I ultimately stopped fencing. Uh -huh. But at the same time, um, I, when I got out of college, I didn't do anything for a year, and then I started, uh, I missed fencing so much, and there was an opportunity to fence at a place called Sal Shazar. Lajo Shazar had been the longtime coach at Penn, and um, Hungarian-born, great guy, big bushy eyebrows. And um, he had an evening program for people who'd gotten out of college. So I started doing that. But I thought, how can I go to fencing just like an hour, two nights a week after I'd been doing 15 hours a week in college? Mm -hmm. So I started running to buttress my training. You had to need to decide a career for yourself after college, and fencing wasn't going to be it. No, <laughs> not quite. So how um, did you make that decision? Well, I always thought I'd go to law school. My dad was a lawyer, and I just adored him. So I think ever since I stopped wanting to be a nun in third grade, I wanted to be a lawyer. But then, and I was accepted. I was going to go to USC. And then 10 days before graduation, I called home and I said, I don't think I want to be a lawyer. So I went uh, home to Philadelphia, lived at home for a year, worked in my dad's law firm, decided I definitely didn't want to be a lawyer. And that's when I decided I wanted to pursue publishing, book publishing, being an English major and uh, loving to read. So that's how I came to New York. 
and today you're a editor of Pub Publishers? Uh, Vice President and Executive Editor at Hachette Books. Oh, okay. Well, as I mentioned at the beginning, the first time I heard of you was through Dr. Dan Hamder. So what was, tell us a story about that book. Well, his book was called Peak Energy, and it was all about having more energy to do everything you love, including sports, but not limited to that. So we were trying to set up a time to meet, and we were having trouble doing so, and he said, how about if we go for a run? And I said, yes, and that didn't even seem strange to me. We ran on the reservoir, but the one thing that I thought he was a little bit eccentric was that he ate a Granny Smith apple as we ran, <laughs> and I've never really seen anybody do that before or since. So it was interesting to see someone eat and run literally at the Maybe same time. Maybe they didn't have a goo. <laughs> exactly. I don't think they had goose then. Oh, this was back in the uh, 80s. So which publishing company were you working at that time? At that time I was at Putnam, G.B. Putnam Sons, which is where I started, and I was there for uh, 19 years. And then I worked at Doubleday Broadway for a bit. I was publisher at Touchstone at Simon & Schuster, and now I'm at Hachette Books. Is, is books making a comeback because, you know, <laughs> so. I, I don't know, who reads nowadays? Well, I know. I, sadly, a lot of people say they just don't have time, but I hope that I'm publishing compelling enough books that people will want to read them. Okay. Well, what are some of the books that you published that you're proud of? So? Well, I'm still proud, although many people might think I'm crazy to be, but I'm very proud. I worked with Lance Armstrong on all three of his books. Uh, it's not about the bike, um, Every Second Counts, and Come Back 2.0. And it's not about the bike especially. is such a great book for people who are suffering from cancer. Mm -hmm. And it's a shame that I think people can't, rightly so, can't erase um, all the you know bad press that's come out right, uh, right. and the information about his performance in dancing right, right. drug use. But as a book, I really think that especially stands out. And I know it's helped a lot of people. So I feel good about that. Because of my interest in sports, I have um, been lucky enough to publish the memoirs of a lot of athletes, including John McEnroe and uh, swimmer Dara Torres, mountain climber Ed Viesters. I did a training book with Kara Goucher and one with Brad Hudson. And I just signed up Dina Castor. That's oh, actually a secret. We haven't announced it yet. We haven't announced it. This is a, this is a <laughs> this Gutterman is exclusive? It's called Running on Happy, and it's all how she uh, learned how to channel optimism and positivity and gratitude, and it helped her running. Interesting. Now, while you were publishing, you left the fencing world, and but now you're not only a good runner, but you're a good triathlete. And actually, there's a funny story there I'd just like to tell, which is how I got into my first race, which mm. is um, I had been running on my local high school track um, when I was back in Philadelphia, and I ran uh, six laps a day, which I knew was a mile and a half. And one time I was out with some friends of mine, some really good guys from Penn State who were fencers, and they were in my Sal Shazar also. And uh, they were putting back the beers, and they were asking me about my running that I was doing, and I told them, you know, I, very proudly, I ran six laps of the track, a mile and a half. And they said, what kind of time are you running that in? And I said, I, I'm running six laps of the track, a mile and a half. I literally didn't understand what they were asking me. <laughs> I kept telling them the distance. And driving home, I thought, oh, Oh, they want to know what kind of time I'm running the mile and a half in. And then um, it was the spring and a race cropped up. It was the first time they ever had it, the clean air run. It was then a five miler. Now it's a 5K and a 10K and they've even changed location. But my dad wanted to do it and he was something of a runner, more a tennis player, but he liked to run too. So he said, I think you should do it. And I said, oh dad, I had, the longest I've ever run is two and a half miles. And he said, in a race situation, you can easily double the longest distance you've run. And like a puppy, I believed him and you know, it was a complete <laughs> lie, uh, but I did get through the race and I came in third overall. So that was kind of a, a rush. And then, though, I won my prize. I still have it. Is a five record set of Igor Stravinsky's music. This 5K or five miler, was it in Philadelphia? Yes, it was in Philadelphia. Because I, it still goes on, huh? It does. In fact, I signed up for it. Uh, I ran it uh, two years ago. I've run it over in the years. As, at, whenever I can, if I'm in town, I can, I can get to Philadelphia, I do it. And it's a great cause. The Clean Air Council uh, is terrific. And now it's on the uh, along the Schuylkill River. So it's a very flat course. Um, 5K, 10K, it's April 16th. If you're interested, uh, you can register. So I highly recommend it. So that was your first in introduction to your dad. Mm -hmm. Excellent. To my dad, my sweet dad. And, uh, but now you're a much loved member of the Central Park Track Club. How did that happen? Well, I was running races, and to tell you the truth, starting salaries and publishing aren't that great. And um, I was running races sometimes without really registering for them, just jumping in. And one of my friends said, you know, you're pretty fast. I think you'd actually win prizes if you would register for these. So I started doing that, and I would win occasional prizes. And I prided myself on being, I, this sounds so crazy, um, on being the first person not affiliated with the, with the track team to finish among the women. Uh -huh. Why I thought this was unattached, something to be proud of. Yeah, the first, yes, first unattached. That was my own, and only in my head, nobody, you know. And then I thought, 
why don't you think about actually joining a team and maybe getting faster and really improving? So uh, I surveyed the landscape, and at the time, uh, I had a friend, Tom Phillips, who was on Central Park Track Club, and we had had the pleasure. I forgot about this. We won um, uh, a trip. I thought it was a gag. I wasn't trusting it at all, but we won the right because of the um, Perrier run, the results of the Perrier run, which used to be the week before the marathon, um, New, the New York Roadrunners was sending a team to the Jimmy Stewart Marathon Relay in Los Angeles. I got to go, and Tom Phillips was on the Central Park Track Club, and he really liked it and spoke well of it. So I wound up applying, but in those days, you really had to get approved, and I did... Um, six weeks with the New York Roadrunners uh, speed work. Oh, you took group it seriously. You went and to get ready for it. For it. Yeah, <laughs> to get ready for it. And then you had to be approved by their board. And so my sister, who had then moved to New York and was living with me in my little studio apartment, knew that I was anxious about this. And so she intercepted the mail and figured out that I had been admitted. And she filled our apartment okay. with orange and blue balloons to celebrate. And just, this was, <laughs> it was uh, 1987. This must be like uh, getting to Yale. You get that thick <laughs> package. You know you got in. I didn't get you any get balloons, the little, though. The little but, yeah. Didn't get it. Exactly. So, in addition to getting a lot faster, really, I've met so many people who are just lifelong friends. I mean, you uh, know how it is in running. And the everybody says with, that about just, their, their yeah, clubs, and that's yeah. why they stay. I think so. What were some of the coaches that you had that really helped you there? Well, George Wisniewski was the coach at the time, and he was just terrific. A bit eccentric, but wonderful. And then Tony Ruiz, sort of his assistant coach, and he's just come completely into his own and for years now has been really the head coach mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. Central Park Track Club's road program. And then Devin Martin is the track coach. Most of my running I've done has been road racing, so it's mm -hmm, been primarily mm -hmm. with Tony that I've been Do you have any favorite races? I have a lot of favorite races. Well, give, um, me, give me the top two. Some of them are in Philadelphia. The Broad Street Run is a real favorite of mine. It's a 10-miler, point-to-point, and very flat. You hit City Hall at the halfway mark, and that's the only time you make a little hook around. Otherwise, you're uh -huh, straight uh -huh. on Broad Street the whole way. And I find a 10-miler is definitely a kinder, gentler half marathon. <laughs> so, <Okay. laughs> and any time in a half marathon, I think, too bad I'm not running the Broad Street run. <laughs> I'd be okay. done by now when I get okay. to the 10-miler. I'm looking forward to the New York City half, which is coming up, and I really enjoy that race as well. Okay. Well, have you done the New York City marathon? And uh, I've done 13 marathons. I've run four New York City marathons. And any of those? Have particularly a favorite one or memorable for any it's reason? It's hard not to love New York. I mean, okay. that's really, I think for a hometown girl, this is now my home, my adoptive home. Philadelphia, so right? I think that's, I've never run the Philadelphia half. My first half, I mean, a uh, Philadelphia marathon. I've run several Philadelphia halves. Um, my first marathon was the Paris marathon, though, so that was pretty special, too. Oh, let's also talk about Something I mentioned at the beginning, full throttle. Full throttle. I love that name. <laughs> it could be, when you first hear it, oh, maybe she's a boater. Yeah. yeah. Full throttle is a terrific triathlon program uh, that operates out of Chelsea Piers, and our head coach and founder of the whole operation is a guy named Scott Berlinger, who is quite a personality, just absolutely terrific. It's his personality, really, that informs the whole program. And he was on the show American Gladiator. He was Viper. <laughs> he was one of the, you know, combating oh. gladiators. What happened is over the years, uh, for a long time, I competed in triathlons. I would do the Central Park Triathlon, and um, oftentimes the last time I was on a bike as I was doing the race was in the race itself the year before. In other words, I did no training whatsoever, but I thought, I can run, I can swim, I can bike, and just as a lark, I would do it. And then... Uh, as I aged up and up and up, I decided uh, to get more serious because I thought, I don't think I'm going, going to be running any more PRs. I thought if I try to get really serious about triathlon, I can at least have the illusion of the ability to get faster in the other endeavors, meaning swimming and uh -huh, cycling. Uh -huh. And so I gradually got more serious about it. I was on a very small triathlon team uh, called uh, Enhance. Uh, which was run by Michael Hansen, who's terrific. I don't know if you know him, but he mm. coaches Asphalt Green okay. Triathlon Club. So he had this team all on his own, and then and there were maybe 20 of us, and he would give us free power bars, and we barely ever trained together, but we wore the enhanced shirts uh -huh. in, in triathlons. Then he decided that he would go coach for full throttle, and he really wanted me to come. And I said, if you think I'm going to be on a team with a name as dumb as Full Throttle, <laughs> you've got another thing coming. So I then, um, you know, I, about a year went by. And then I thought, you know, I think I really would like to get more, even more serious about triathlon. And I'm kind of lost without Enhance because he at least coached me in cycling. So I showed up for my first workout, which I remember vividly. We, the team then at that point met at uh, right near Columbus Circle, right where that entrance is in the park. And I show up, and I feel like skinny runner girl masquerading as a 
cyclists because they're all there, all guys in my memory at least, they're all built like fire hydrants and I'm used to, you know, my Central Park Track Club teammates who tend to be built like right, this right, right. and um, they all had bike uniforms on and they were team uniforms and they all said full throttle and I wheeled up very timidly, I, I just had a t-shirt on, you know, no cool pockets or anything and the first thing I heard out of Scott's mouth was, okay, we're doing two by two pace line. If you cannot stay on the wheel in front of you, leave now. I started to wheel away. <laughs> so I didn't want any part of this. And some people like to be yelled at in the morning or by coaches. I am not one of them. And Michael Hansen had wheeled in behind me. I didn't know. And he grabbed my shirt and he said, you're not going anywhere. And I was like, oh, Michael, this is so not my scene. I really want to get out of here. But I, as I, I stayed, I did the workout. And as I later started to realize, Scott was half serious and half kidding. Like, he, he has a stern side, but I just got to see the stern, barky side first before uh -huh. I got any of the humor. Uh -huh. So I didn't really know how to take it, and I was intimidated already. I mean, I think that's actually a good thing to remember, I think, for me, because if you're already feeling intimidated, it's very easy for whatever interaction happens next to play into your anxiety, mm -hmm. and that's exactly what happened. But it's good to stick it out, um, and I did, and uh, it's really been fabulous. It's, I've met the greatest people. I mean, I think people who go on teams, especially some how this triathlon team because we work we train we start working out at 5 45 in the morning down at chelsea pier so i get up at 4 30 in the morning just it's almost a 45 minute commute no matter how you uh -huh, slice uh -huh. it so uh the kind of people that we self-select to be in this kind of group oh, yeah. um and of course at work they think i'm in the marines or something but really it's like a party every day except we train really hard and this morning we had a 500 meter time trial in the water so that was what i was doing at 6 a.m this morning after warming up but um, it's been a great group. I've really improved my cycling and my swimming. I've had the opportunity to compete in nationals and worlds, the world championships, which has been great. And along the way, uh, I was doing duathlon. I've actually been more successful in duathlon when I'm not injured from running. So um, duathlon, that's bike and? It's run, bike, run. One bike, one. Oh, yeah. okay. So it's pretty tough. You do a 5K run, then a 25K bike, I mean a 40K bike rather, which is about 25 miles, and then a 10K run. Okay. So you're working it. And the first year I did it, I was the national champion in my age group. The first year the you did it? The very first year I did it, yeah. Eventually, I've, I've gotten the bronze medal twice at the World Championships. That's fabulous. Edinburgh and Concord. Now, where, where did that DNA thing come from? <laughs> oh, you said your dad was a, a runner. My dad was a runner, and he was actually in high school. I think he ran the 400, so maybe I got some speed from him. And I don't know. My so, mother played field hockey. But a lot of hard work was in it, you know. It wasn't yes. just talent. You had some talent, and you really worked it. I think so. Um, I hope so. Um, one of my coaches actually said that he thought I worked my talent to the absolute maximum that it is, such as it is. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. You got a little Lance Armstrong in you. I hope, I hope so, in a good way, yes. Yeah, and oh. he's still my friend, I have to say. Okay. I mean, I, well, that's good. I think we don't have to endorse everything our friends do, so. <laughs> okay. Oh, wow. Uh, <laughs> this, is, <laughs> this is an amazing uh, career that you're having and but you also blog because I do, I, I've seen I do. It. and you talk yeah. about your, your special need pets well tell us about your love for animals I've always been a cat person actually more than a dog person um, so I've always had cats for years I wanted a French Bulldog and way before they became trendy dogs and I have proof friends would send me calendars and stuff of French Bulldogs and then finally I had an opportunity to get one and I have Hazel who's just adorable and I got her uh, two years ago, almost right now, February, February, end of February is when I picked her up. And, but I always felt a little guilty that I hadn't gotten a rescue dog. So then Lulu Bell um, was my special needs dog because I, I started looking for dogs on sites and there are terrific rescue groups that get the dogs out of the shelters. And then thanks to the internet, they have robust write-ups under pictures of them. You know, Misty is the best dog I've ever met. If I didn't have three already, I would definitely keep her, that kind of thing. I read that too. So mm. then under this one dog I was looking, it had her picture and then it just said blind dog. Like it didn't even have a good write-up. And I thought, oh my gosh, this poor dog. So. So uh, that, of course, was the dog that my heart went out to, and I adopted her. Lots of funny things happen. Lots of amazingly great coincidences happen. People help me out in amazing ways. So I've thought that this is enough um, fodder for a blog. I call it a blog, um, but some of my posts are pretty long, so it's sort of a long serial. And in fact, I'm overdue for uh, an entry. It's mostly about the relationship with your dog. I thought it was going to be mainly about the, my dog, and it really is about her because she's the sweetest thing, and she uh, honestly, her, she is so amazing. It turns out she can see a little tiny bit and uh, she just is 
has been a great example for me for for one thing there are two stairs down my uh, after you get off my elevator where I live and at first she was very timid intimidated by it because she couldn't see but then once she kind of got a feel for the lay of land she just flies down the two of them and, but then just a lot of funny things happened I didn't like to leave her behind so I, I took her to a triathlon in South Beach in Florida with me really? and meanwhile she looked terrible from this reaction her skin would sort of get hard and peel off I mean she was really like zombie dog she looked terrible I mean one guy an Hispanic guy saw her and started in Spanish saying the Hail Mary, which I recognize from my Catholic school days, even though it was in Spanish. Another woman just started to cry. I mean, she really stopped traffic. She, poor thing, she really looked very, very bad. But um, but wow. funny, like I said, funny things happen too and good things. I got her as a puppy, so she was quite small and it's easy to travel. I still travel with Hazel. Dogs have to be under 20 pounds and fit in a... Um, uh, carrier that can fit under your seat in front of you. But you also got all your tri equipment. You got how can you, can well, you travel I'm with lucky, your bike? Well, Princess can travel with uh, full throttle, so they take my bike down in a trailer, and uh, that's how my bike gets there. So I'm just a regular citizen with a dog. Ah, um, one and advantage my, to full throttle. Is uh, they many take advantages care. to full uh, throttle, okay. but that's one of them. Yes. All right. All right. Yeah. Well, it sounds like a great program. It, I think I was reading. It's a year-long program. Actually, I think it's a 44-week program, or at least the first year I did it for the, the whole thing. One year I just did the cycling in the summer, and I didn't do the whole, you know, nine yards and join and swim and cycle and uh, run with them. But the first year I did that, we were in the pool the first day, and Scott announced, okay, this is the first week of our 44-week program, and I just burst out laughing. I was the only one, and it's only because in book publishing, I've done a lot of weight loss books. I've done a lot of fitness books. And if we could sell that, you know, you can click your heels and work out for two minutes a day, you know, we're always trying to undersell right, what right, you have right. to put into it. And here he was proudly, you know, with absolutely no qualms, announcing this is a 44-week program. <laughs> so it just really made me laugh. Very, very different audience. Yes, thank goodness. Self-selecting audience, yeah. Well, interesting. So what lessons have you learned carrying, you know, 44-week programs into now you try to sell a book that you know you could do things in two three minutes chunks or half hours. I actually personally haven't done those books and I'm very proud of the fitness books that I have done and they really do involve working out and uh, although my authors often agree we have to sort of sometimes lure people into yeah, yeah. working out and then we hope that that'll be the starting point and then they'll get get more them to involved. crawl first and then uh, exactly and hopefully exactly they'll, they'll want more and more and more yeah a little bit like you you know you started running around the track six times around yeah. and <laughs> I thought and it would now lead to this. You're now doing I'm going marathons. around the world to compete in championships. You know, we're running out of time, but I wanted to cover mm -hmm. something happened last year that that put you in the hospital. Oh, yeah. You were trying to run a half marathon even though you were sick. What was the story no, there? No, well, what happened was I was going to run the Philadelphia Mar I'm sorry, the Philadelphia Half Marathon, the Gore-Tex Half that's affiliated with the marathon. So this was the weekend before Thanksgiving, and three weeks before that. I had run the other Philly half that had got bumped because of the Pope. Because I, I, the Pope for, visit, for a minute, yeah. I thought, why am I running two half marathons three weeks apart? But I'd done the first one, and I had run 133.17, and I had Dina Castor, my new author, cheering for me because she has an affiliation with that race. It's the rock and roll half. So I was at the expo having a great time, got three pairs of my favorite brand of shoe for $160 for the whole three of them, got some tights, got this, got that, and then I thought... First of all, your stomach is beginning to hurt, and you have a little backache, too, and then you are on your feet way too long to be running a half marathon the next day. So I went home, went to bed at 4 o'clock, got up to eat. I'll spare the details. I had, like, bad stomach flu symptoms. Wound up in the ER where they did a CAT scan to see if I had kidney stones, but I had a kidney tumor the size of a softball oh my on my God. left kidney. So it was really not how I planned to spend my race so day. So they immediately operated? Uh... Mm -hmm. it was, I was very lucky. If you have to have a kidney tumor, everything went well from there. Uh, it, right away on the face of it, they knew it was benign. Um, but 85% of kidney tumors are cancerous, so I'm very, very lucky. Wow. And um, I odds. got a great doctor, uh, thanks to my brother-in-law, Sean Kleitz, who works at Temple University Hospital. And I went back for my one check, and I'm good to go. And I ran a race three and a half weeks after my, kind of against doctor's orders, so shh, don't tell Dr. Uh, Un. <laughs> you're not the only <laughs> but, one uh, sitting there yeah. <laughs> doing things that uh, <laughs> doctors not would not want to hear about. Yeah, they were not, probably would be pleased with it, but I so ran on New Year's Day. Weeks, I wanted to you, start. you were on your feet running. Uh, three and a half, but yes. Well, yes, within four weeks. Exactly. Three and a half. You want to be precise. Well, I was supposed to wait six weeks. So, six weeks. Yeah. Well, oh, the residents not, all said six weeks. My doctor looked at me and said four that's weeks. probably within the plus or minus. I think so. I think so. <laughs> but anyway, it worked out. It worked out.
you, yeah. you know, sometimes I've also heard stories that back in the hospital. <laughs> Luckily, that didn't happen. Okay, great, yeah. great. So the future looks good for you. In terms I hope of? so. Knock wood, knock wood. Yep. So, so what are some of your future plans? I am doing the Washington Heights 5K, and I think it's March 6th. I'm doing the New York City Half on March 20th. I'm doing the South Beach uh, Triathlon on April 2nd. And um, my two big races of the year are, one is the Mont Tremblant, 70.3. I've never done a half Ironman. Is that in Canada? Uh, yes, it is. May we? And I have Tri-Worlds in Cozumel, Mexico in September. Well, that's, a, that's a lot. And then professionally, you mentioned uh, a few projects coming up. Was Dina Castor, I think? Her book is called Running on Happy okay. coming up. I'm looking forward to that. Any other books you can mention? Um, not any running books, really, but I have everything from a, a wonderful memoir called Truffle Boy that's all about a, a kid, really, who uh, created his own business and has a, an exotic food and uh, truffle business here in New York. He's only 23. Oh, it's a true story. It's a true story. I have a book called My Lost Brothers, which is about an incredibly tragic fire, uh, the Yarnell Hill Fire in uh, Arizona. And my book is by the lone survivor. 19 firefighters perished in that uh, oh. really terrible, terrible oh, cool. story. And it's oh. becoming a movie. They're starting to shoot it in June. And I can't say the big actors who were in it, but they're big. <laughs> <laughs> so we're excited about that. Well, that's interesting. And you get I to get the inside new... scoop on all sorts of things. Yep, and I'm publishing a novel by Pete Townsend. Pete Townsend, the, the singer? Wow. The Who fame. Oh, he's got a fascinating life. I'm pretty, I'm pretty yeah, lucky, I, yeah. I, I've worked with a lot I, of... I, I hope you're what happy. happens in book publishing is if you do one book and it succeeds, then people think of you for that type of book all the time. So I did Rick Springfield's memoir, Late Late at Night, uh -huh. and then I wound up doing Billy Idol's memoir, Marky Ramone's memoir, and Duff McKagan's memoir from Guns N' Roses. And same with uh, athletes. I got to do a, a host of athletes. But I've been lucky because I've had a very, very varied career. I, I published The Devil Wears Prada, and uh, I did a book that won the Pulitzer Prize for nonfiction in 2009. So... Put, put the devil book? No, that didn't win. That's fiction, and that did not win the Pulitzer Prize. The but book, a great movie. The won the Pul it is a great movie. Thank you. And the Pulitzer Prize winner was Slavery by Another Name by Doug Blackman. Well, of course, that begs the question. When are you doing your book? <laughs> I don't know. Well, maybe my blog. I'd like to turn my blog into a book, so we'll see. And what would you call it? Not, not full throttle. <laughs> I don't know what I'd call it. No, it would be called Lulu Bell or Adventures with Lulu Bell. I don't know. I have to work on the title. Okay. Well, on that note. Oh, great. Thank you so much for coming in. Thank you. I really appreciate it. This is wonderful. Pleasure.